The CSB is the best Bible translation for certain people in certain circumstances. And for random reasons I might explain later, I'm standing outside of the major temple, the Mormon temple in Salt Lake City to tell you this. I'm coming to you not live from a camp in the beautiful mountains of Utah. I'm preaching from the King James Version actually for a little weekend retreat for youth. The churches represented here all use the King James. And because of that, the CSB is not the best Bible for this circumstance, but it is for others. Who are those certain people and what are those certain circumstances? I'll tell you. And I'll tell you something pretty nerdy cool about the CSB too in a minute. Stay tuned and I'll talk about what math tells us about the CSB. Not kidding. Number one, the CSB is best for you if your church already uses the CSB. If your pastor chose the CSB, be grateful. He did good. The CSB website says that more than 100 scholars from 17 denominations participated in the translation and review of the Holman Christian Standard Bible, first published as a complete text in 2004. The HCSB has been rebranded as of 2017 as the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Of the dozens of names on the list of these translators, I recognize nearly 40 meaning either that I'd read something by them or read reviews of something by them or seen them in evangelical biblical studies circles. They hail from many institutions serving evangelical students. They write commentaries and journal articles and dictionary entries and monographs. They do conferences and teach classes. Maybe I've said this too many times on this channel already, but in case you're new here, when you collect this many trained and gifted evangelical scholars to make an English Bible translation, they're probably not going to commit too many obvious errors. They might miss some obscure bits of Hebrew, but then the King James translators themselves said they were simply unsure of the meaning of some obscure Hebrew terms like names of some plants and animals. Surely, if we had a God's eye view, we would see a few things in the CSB that truly ought to be changed, nay, corrected. But the likelihood that those things are found in significant doctrinal places is very low. The likelihood that they warrant you putting pressure on your pastor to switch to a different translation for your church, if you're already using a contemporary translation, that likelihood is even lower, like lower than the temperature of your grandmother's extremities. Lower than molasses in January that's been placed on the bottom shelf in the basement. Lower than Larry Flint. Number two, the CSB is best for people who want an optimal blend of quote-unquote readability and quote-unquote accuracy. Now, I just hate putting it this way. Language is super way maximum more complicated and interesting than the picture I get when people bandy these two values about readability versus accuracy. Quit bandying you guys, totally. I've come to conclude that readability and accuracy aren't really separable in translation anyway. A readable translation that isn't accurate isn't really a translation. It's a paraphrase or something worse. An accurate translation of the Bible that isn't readable isn't accurate. Or it's only accurate if the passage was unreadable to its original writer and readers. Are we really going to say this about the Bible, that God inspired unreadable portions or that he used words nobody knew they were misunderstanding? But as often with non-specialists, there is something substantive lying underneath the bandying field. Translators do get to make judgment calls. They have to. And sometimes they have an ear for the way people talk, or even as in the case of Tyndale, the way they should or will talk. Translation is a constant tension between sticking to the forms of the original, the, the word order and sentence structure and other stuff, and getting the message across to readers. Listen to people talk who have to translate from any language to any other, and you'll hear them say, I totally get what they're saying here in Spanish or French or Urdu or Kazakh, but it's really hard to put into English. Good and intelligent people are permitted to differ about how close to stick to the forms of the original in such cases. They're free to work by feel and not by strict rules, because translation is an art and not just a science. Language isn't reducible to math. People have actually tried, I'm not kidding, to invent languages that are perfectly logical and that eliminate the possibility of misunderstanding. Lobjan is the most famous example I know of. It's almost like a kind of math equation 
But the sources I trust, that would be Arika Okrent's popular level book on invented languages, tell me that Lobjan is an ultimate failure. This doesn't surprise me in the least. And yet, what's super interesting is that you can do a little math of a sort on a Bible translation and observe the results of the art. And someone has done it. His name is Andy Wu, and I've met him. And I'm going to walk back the other direction. I've actually interviewed him at Faith Life Bible Tech Conference. Here's the thing. If there's one pro-KJV-only meme that I really feel I eviscerated, incinerated, and obliterated, that I beat to death and then burned alive, and after that kept on bread and water for six weeks, it's the idea that the flesh Kincaid reading level analysis proves that the King James Version is on a fifth grade reading level. There's lies, you know what kind of lies, and statistics. And I showed that people who cite flesh Kincaid have no idea what they're really doing when they use it to prove King James readability. So I was skeptical when I first encountered Wu's work. I wasn't sure that computer-generated statistics could tell us very much useful information about Bible translation. But I knew Andy was a serious guy, and I saw quickly that he knew just what he was doing, that he had acted responsibly. That doesn't mean his conclusions are airtight or heaven-sent. <clears throat> it means that he helped use a combination of math and careful reading to tell us something useful about the CSB. I'm going to talk you through his report and show you why I think it was so responsible. It's called A Quantitative Evaluation of the Christian Standard Bible, and it compares the CSB with most of the major Bible versions used by evangelical Christians who speak English. Wu is an expert in machine learning and he helped create the Cascadia syntax graphs of the New Testament, which are used by advanced Logos Bible software users, though they ought to be used by more people, and maybe this video will give you a taste of why. Though Andy Wu's report on the CSB does not reveal his methodology in detail, it's clear enough what he did, and uh, what he did was he measured the literalness and the readability of each translation based on a few criteria I will explain. Then he weighed the balance between the two, I'm on record as saying that computers cannot read, and this is true. I believe it will always be true. But with the help of humans who can read, computers can mimic certain aspects of reading, things humans like Wu have taught them to recognize. I don't fully understand all this, not the computer side. I do understand the linguistic side, however. Wu used two measures for literalness, one of which I've talked about in detail on this channel and he used two measures for readability, one of which I've talked about in massive detail on this channel. His measures for literalness were the transfer rate of syntactic relations and the consistency rate of word choices. Syntactic relations is just technical terminology for the basic meaning-carrying units of a sentence. You know them as subject, verb, and object. Basically, people like Wu have taught computers to guess, I assume pretty accurately, which words in a given English sentence fit in which slot, subject, verb, or object, plus a few other less important relations. And they've actually also gone through and marked by hand all these syntactic relations in the Greek New Testament, at least that, maybe the Hebrew Old Testament. It produces a tree that looks like this showing where the subject and verb are in a given sentence and how other words relate to them. Let me stop and point out that I just cannot imagine a situation where a computer could accurately diagram every sentence in the Bible. Only a human can do this. Like my dissertation advisor, Randy Leedy of ntgreekguy.com, who diagrammed the entire Greek New Testament. Diagramming requires understanding what you're reading, and computers can't do that. But its simplest aspects, subject, verb, and object, can be guessed at by computers, apparently, especially in English. Wu had the computer diagram the Hebrew and Greek texts to display the subjects, verbs, and objects. That is, Wu used, I believe, handmade syntax graphs of the Greek New Testament, and possibly of portions of the Hebrew Bible. Then, if I'm understanding correctly, he used syntax graphs that were automatically generated by computer, uh, what humans taught it to do. Then he used reverse interlinear data, basically little lines humans drew between the original languages and the English, to see how often the diagrams matched up between the original languages and the English. The more a given translation sentence diagrams matched, those of the originals, the more literal it might be considered to be. 
Now this might raise a question, why doesn't every Bible translation perfectly match the Hebrew and Greek syntactic relations, matching subjects to subjects, verbs to verbs, and objects to objects? That seems pretty straightforward, right? I mean, wouldn't that be the very first job of every translator? Let me just talk through one example. I don't have access to Wu's data, so I can't verify that this is the kind of thing that he was measuring, but I feel reasonably confident. Think of Ephesians 2, 1 to 2. Very literally, the Greek reads, And you being dead in the trespasses and the sins of you, in which once you walked according to the age of this world, etc. This is just the beginning of a crazy long Pauline Greek sentence, one which isn't really a sentence, because the main verb does not actually come along until, well, actually, it never technically comes along. Randy Leedy's stellar notes to his Greek New Testament diagrams explain very well what Paul is doing here. He gets so wrapped up in his qualifiers and explanations for what we were up to when we were dead that he ends up ending the clause before he can get to the main verb. Nobody that I've seen has the heart, however, to make a non-sentence in English translation when they come to this passage. So they divvy up Paul's long non-sentence in various ways. You being dead is a participial phrase, something Greek loves to do but English does not. So many English translations quote-unquote change the syntactic relations here to make the English flow more naturally. They turn you being dead into a finite verb. You were dead. Pretty much every major English translation, including the King James Version, does something that is technically different from the Greek here. Good and smart Christians disagree about how often and in what circumstances translators should be free to adjust syntactic relations to make sentences flow more naturally in the target language. But every single Bible translation does this sort of thing. They only differ on how often and under what circumstances. Wu mapped those differences of opinion. We'll see his stats in a minute. He also mapped how often translations practice concordance, as I've called it, or what he called consistency rate of word choices. The King James translators actually talk about this specifically in their preface, and they specifically reject this as a principle. They say that it should be okay to translate a given Hebrew word with several different English ones in different places, like journeys in some places and travels in others. That is just one of many examples that they give. Wu knows, as the King James translators did, that it is impossible to maintain perfect c consistency in word choice in Bible translation. Language simply does not work that way. As Wu says, exact lexical equivalence between languages is rare. Lexical just means the semantic range uh, of words, what words can mean, what senses they can bear. They just don't match language to language between any two. And as I often say, God gave us this situation, so chill. What this means is that some translations are more consistent in rendering a given Hebrew or Greek word with a specific English one. Some are less consistent. They prize using an English word that fits well in the context over using one that could sort of work, but only if you're set on consistency. Which, as someone said, is the hobgoblin of little minds. Which isn't quite fair, but there's some truth in it. Concordance can be measured only if humans have gone through and measured, as has been done in Logos, which is why it's an advanced tool, and done what's called mapping, showing which English words are translations of which Hebrew and Greek words. We will see the results of Wu's measures of concordance in a bit. Now we turn to Wu's two readability measures, syntactic fluency rate and common vocabulary rate. The latter will be an easier concept to understand for viewers of my channel. It measures the conformity of vocabulary to current usage. It assumes that a translation is easier to read if more of the words it uses are in daily, the, the daily usage corpus of the target language. This is very like what I do in step five of my false friends process, where I use the news on the web corpus to see how do today's writers actually use various English words. A corpus, that's just Latin for body, is just a huge, huge body of written or transcribed texts. The idea behind a corpus uh, is the foundation of all linguistics, something that most people outside the field don't understand in my experience. And that idea is that the speakers and writers of a language are the ones who define what the language is and what its rules are. The lexicographers at Merriam-Webster are not telling us 
what words should mean in some heaven-sent way. They're describing what words in fact do mean. What do people right now use them to mean? This measure of woos is necessarily inexact, therefore, because, as my 50 False Friends series shows, the King James Version might use a current word but in an older sense, and so could some of the contemporary versions. But still, this measure works best on contemporary translations. But when combined with other measures, it does help contribute to the overall picture. The syntactic fluency rate is similar, but it measures not words so much as sentence patterns. It assumes that a translation is easier to read if its sentence patterns are more similar to those found in daily usage. So instead of comparing syntactic relations between the original language text and the English translations, it compares them between English translations and a corpus of written English. So that was pretty tough, complicated. If you followed all that, let's get to the stats. What did Wu come up with? What were his results? I think the results tend to validate his methods because they match up pretty well with the subjective feel of lots of readers, which is, I think, the best measure, just one that's harder to quantify. You've seen the formal to functional spectrum graphic. Wu's work essentially reproduces it with some minor shakeups. Using Wu's measures, the ESV transfers syntactic relations more consistently than any other translation. The New Living Translation does it that the least often. Using Wu's measures, the King James Version is more consistent in its use of the principle of concordance than any other major translation. This is so interesting because the King James translator specifically denied feeling obligated to do this. And as I showed in my Incredinasby video, Robert Young actually took them to task for this very perceived failure. Wu is a scholar. He knows what he's doing. He openly admits that his evaluation metrics are still quite basic because he's only evaluating words rather than senses of words. But he points out that no one has made a complete database of word senses in Hebrew and Greek Bibles. And computers can only count what people have fed into their electronic maws. If you buy the measures of literalness that Wu use, you actually get the ESV at the top, the NASB, then the New King James, and at the bottom, as anyone familiar with these translations would have expected, you get the NET, NIV, and NLT. And lo and behold, in the middle is the CSB. Note that the figures of translations at the top are extremely close to one another. We're not talking about massive differences here. But there is still a clear st statistically significant difference between the top and the bottom. The ESV is clearly more literal by Wu's measures than is the NLT. Wu also shares the stats for his two readability measures. As expected, the graph flips. The New Living Translation is more syntactically fluent and uses more common vocabulary. It matches current English better than other translations. The King James is at the bottom in both cases. But at least in common vocabulary rate, the difference among contemporary translations is not large. The distance between the New Living Translation at the top and the New King James at the bottom of the modern versions is very small. In other words, all contemporary translations do a good job of using common vocabulary. The King James is the outlier, as I would certainly have predicted, but it's not at 0%, it's, it's at 65%. This helps validate what I've said so often in this channel. The King James is still largely intelligible, but it's in the process over time because of language change of becoming less intelligible. I'm taking you through this report about as fast as I can. Now it's time to skip to the summary graph. Put simply, the New Living Translation, New International Version, and New English Translation are connected in one group that is more readable and less literal. The ESV, the New American Standard Bible, and the New King James Version are quite close even overlapping on a spot that is less readable, though not a lot less, and more literal. And lo and behold, the CSB is almost right on the line, bisecting the X and Y axes. In other words, it is the evangelical translation that best balances readability and accuracy. I must stress that at every single point in Wu's analysis, someone could measure the data differently, and someone could certainly weigh the results differently. I don't even think Wu is saying that literalness should be viewed as superior to not-so-literalness. I certainly don't say that. But bring your values to his data, and it will help you judge the value of various Bible translations. The burden is certainly on others to do this kind of work with anything even remotely approaching the sophistication and care that Wu has used. This little report is, in my mind, quite an achievement. It's one of those significant achievements, however, like E equals MC squared, that few people can really understand. 
Hopefully now, because of this video, a few more can understand. I encourage you to read the report for yourself. The link is in the show notes. I think there is a lot to learn from his methods. Therefore, because of these two previous points, the CSB is best for people who can't make up their minds between formal and functional translations. You know, I'm kind of one of those people. I used to assume early in seminary that literal translations like the New American Standard Bible were simply superior to dynamic ones like the NIV. Then I came to feel maybe a little ways into seminary that each approach was useful, but that still I had to figure out once and for all which of the two approaches was better. Sunday, 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 ESV versus NIV showdown. Special appearances by Arnold Schwarzenegger, Vince McMahon, and John Piper. Then I started to realize that I didn't want either side to win. I liked having both kinds of Bible translations, and I liked being able to turn to one or the other in specific situations. Evangelism is a good time for the NIV. Expository preaching is a good time for the ESV, I felt, and still do. I've also come to realize from experience something I was warned about by some people at my church in college. Not every church is full of people with formal Bible training, as in my Christian college town. It really does seem like the CSB is getting the reputation of being a good middle ground, formal enough to be useful for close Bible study, functional enough to be accessible to people who don't read quite as well as people in Christian college towns. Still, I insist we're not talking about a massive difference between the ESV and the CSB, or between the CSB and the NIV, but that's just it. The CSB is in between the ESV and NIV. Number four. The CSB is the best Bible translation for people who feel the CSB buzz that's going on right now. The King James Version has been slammed by lots of people who, crazy, I know, think that overall it's too archaic. NIV, it's been slammed by people who think it's part of a secret feminist cabal. The ESV has been slammed by people, including this morning when I woke up on Twitter, who, Twitter, who think it's part of a patriarchalist cabal. The New American Standard Bible has been slammed by lots of people for being wooden and stilted. The NASB 2020 hasn't been out long enough to uh, get a new reputation. The New Living Translation has been slammed by skateboarders for speaking less formally than they do. Now, most of that was tongue in cheek, but what I'm saying is that a lot of the major English Bible translations out there in the evangelical space have been out long enough to have collected groups of detractors who kind of speak in unison. The CSB, it seems, kind of doesn't have that. It isn't attached to any agenda in the public mind. It doesn't send a signal yet about what tribe you're in. And there's an appeal there. I like that. If I were planting a church today, I would strongly consider the CSB for this reason. And because it hits such a happy medium between formal and functional renderings. Also, the CSB had a whole committee of scholars dedicated to catching things that the translators accidentally overlooked. It was called the Translation Oversight Committee. Cool. I'm kidding. That was truly not funny. Next week, the NIV is the best Bible translation.